Well, tonight I would direct your attention to our scripture for study, and that is found in 1 Thessalonians, the book of 1 Thessalonians, and uh, in your pew Bible, if you're following along there, you'll find our passage found on page 1,146. Our main passage is going to be found in chapter 2, verse 13, uh, but we're also going to be looking at a little bit of chapter 1, so I want to read that in its entirety. And uh, tonight, the topic, as we're in the center of the means of grace, or the, the exposition, the catechism on the means of grace, tonight we come to what we just sung about, the fact that God's primary means of grace is through His Word. And uh, Paul writes the church in Thessalonica, which we are familiar with. Two weeks ago, we looked at the foundation, or the, the funding, uh, founding of this church, rather, how Paul preached to them, and how some believed. Paul now will speak of that uh, in his first letter to them. So let us begin reading at chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll turn our attention to chapter 2, verse 13. This is God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We, are always, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And then look just across the line there to chapter 2, verse 13. This is kind of our main text tonight. Paul says there, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God which is at work in you who believe. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And for our Westminster Shorter Catechism text tonight, you can turn in the back of your Psalter hymnal to page 974. Page 974, just to remind you of where we are last week, we began our examination of what we call the means of grace, uh, looking at what the Catechism says is the outward and ordinary means, and uh, we focused on the fact that God has chosen certain means to continue our walk with Him, and uh, we noted how we are called to be lifelong disciples, and this means of grace are what we use to continue in our discipleship. Now tonight we're going to be looking at question and answers 89 and 90, which deals with the Word. As always, I'll read the question, and together we will respond with the answer. Question 89 asks, how is the Word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners, and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Now question and answer 90 is where we're going to get all our application from. And it asks, how is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? That the word may become effectual to salvation, 
we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Receive it with faith and love. Lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. And that is our confession this evening. Let's join our hearts together now in a time of congregate or pray, prayer for the preaching of the word together. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, indeed, as we come to the topic tonight of the means of grace through your word, we pray, Lord, that this means of grace would reign true tonight in our hearts and our lives. Father, we have come here not to hear any word of a mere man. We have not come to hear a preacher. Father, we have come to hear from you. And so, Father, now from this living word that you have inspired through the Holy Spirit, speak now that as we have just sung, build up your church to the speaking and preaching of your word. And Father, may we hear it tonight that the Holy Spirit would be active among us to open our hearts, to call lost sinners out of darkness unto life, and to encourage us through this means of grace. And so, Father, be with us to that end, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, if you think about voice recognition, it's quite remarkable that you and I uh, can recognize uh, voices of people you know very well. And in fact, actually, as you get to know someone, uh, you get to recognize their voice more and more. Perhaps as you made a friend, uh, you recognize your voice a little bit, but as the years have gone by, it's quite remarkable that you can recognize your voice even in the midst of a crowd. In fact, as a kid, I remember my mom calling to me uh, in the middle of a crowd, and, and I could recognize her voice, her voice whether I wanted to hear it or not, because I had heard her voice so much. I could pick it out of all of the other mother's voices, uh, and I recognized it because I had heard it before. As well, it stands out to me that when we get to know someone so well, there's a sense in which they can answer the phone and without even telling you who they are. Isn't it amazing that you can recognize the voice of them even over the phone? Well, tonight, that's what we're here to learn about. Voice recognition. Only not the voice recognition of any friend or parent, but tonight as we come to the topic of the means of grace of God's Word, we are told that that is how we learn to hear the voice of God. That in His Word, both the, the reading of it, but as the Catechism said, especially the preaching of it, we're not here to hear the words and the voice of a preacher, but in this, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what the Bible tells us is that you come to hear actually the very voice of God Himself through the Word. And what actually is remarkable about the means of grace is that just as you've come to faith through the means of the Word, you also grow accustomed to hear the voice of your Father through the Word. So that as you spend years of hearing the Word as a son or daughter, over and over through the Word, you come ac accustomed to hearing the voice of none other than your Heavenly Father. And you see, that's why it's a means of grace. Because as you hear the voice of your Father through the difficulties of life, through the joys of life, and all of this, the Word of our Father comes to us, and it grows us in the faith. It is that means of grace as you recognize the voice of your Father through the very Word that He has given to us. And that tonight is what the Word of God is. It is the Holy Spirit converting through the Word and continuing to reveal the message of the Father through this means of both preaching and study of the Word. Now, as we, the Westminster Catechism begins to expound this, it notes that it's, as I've already said, the primary means. Now, what that means is simply that all the other means that are going to flow from this flow from the Word. The sacraments are no good unless they flow from the Word. Prayer is no good unless it flows from the Word. And so the Catechism rightly begins right here. We need to understand what this book is that you hold in your hand and how it functions in your own life for any of the other means of grace to actually be of benefit to you. And I want to focus tonight, mainly by the application towards the end, on showing you that all of this is about a relationship. God says from beginning to end, I'm speaking to you. I want a relationship with you. And the means of grace is really us growing accustomed to getting to know our Father and hearing Him speak to us. So my theme is simply this. It's a very simple one right from the Catechism. We simply learn tonight that the Holy Spirit causes the Word to grow our faith. The Holy Spirit causes the Word to grow our faith. 
And I have three points that I want to tackle tonight. First of all, we need to note the worker of the Word. The worker of the Word, that's the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul, two times in the passage we read, notes that it's the Holy Spirit who is the worker that applies the Word. Secondly, we need to note the work of the Word. The work of the Word. What is it that the Word is to be used for? And then thirdly, and here's our application part, the way of the Word. How are we, by way of the Word, to grow in it? And the Catechism gives us numerous examples, and I just want to go through them in turn with you to see, by way of application, how we make use of this means of grace. So first of all, who is the worker of the Word? Well, the question and answer uh, gives us the Westminster Catechism. It, it begins by this phrase, that the Spirit of God maketh the Word effectual. And that is the worker. The Catechism says that, that the Word of God is only effectual in your life and my life through none other than the Holy Spirit making it work. It is the role of the third person of the Trinity to bless this living Word and make it alive in your heart and in your life. Now, where do we see that in 1 Thessalonians? Well, first of all, we get a glimpse of it in verse 13 of chapter 2. Notice that with me again. It says, and we also thank God continually because, and, and think of this, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Now notice what Paul just said there. Paul says, when I came to you preaching the gospel, it was not my voice that you actually heard, but you understood who you were hearing. It was none other than the Word of God speaking to you. Now many, or, or two weeks ago rather, we noted this. When Paul came to Thessalonica in Acts 17, we went through the four descriptions of him preaching the Word. Paul heralded the Word as a messenger of the King. And we noted there that Paul gave urgency to the message. We also noted that Paul came debating tone, now a dialogue. He went back and forth giving examples and evidence from the Word of God to convince the church or to convince the believers there that Jesus was the Messiah. But notice how Paul describes that ministry. Paul says that when I did that, you didn't receive that as my words, but you received it as the actual Word of God. Now how remarkable is that? Paul is saying that the preached word is the very word of God when it's faithfully preached to God's people. Paul is saying that he is simply an instrument used by God to bear God's voice to his people. They heard Paul preaching, but in their hearts they were hearing their father speak to them through the very word that he brought to them. And that's significant tonight. That shows you why, as the Catechism says, Preaching is really the primary means, if you will, of how the Word actually functions. Uh, we heard that this week in the examination of Brother Noble. Someone asked him about the Second Helvetic Confession. And it actually makes this statement that when the Word is faithfully preached, it is the very Word of God. And we need to qualify that. Uh, because uh, if the Word is not faithfully preached, clearly it's not the Word of God. But that is what Paul is saying. When a pastor rightly expounds the Word of God, when he takes you to it and line by line and is faithfully showing the congregation what the Word of God is saying and he heralds the message, listen to what Paul says. It's the very Word of God. God is speaking through the preacher. God is speaking through the teaching. And when it is faithfully done, the Holy Spirit speaks in that moment, making it the voice of God to His people. Now, notice as well, in verse 1, Paul says it wasn't just the Word of God that they heard, but he makes it very explicit that it's the Holy Spirit who did this. Look at verse 4 of chapter 1. It says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, you know how we lived among you for your sake. And Paul kind of puts a finer edge on it. Notice that. Paul says, when we came to you, you didn't just hear the words in the gospel that we came, but it actually did something in you. It changed your life. And what does he attribute to that life transformation? He says that it was the Holy Spirit through the word that did this. Paul actually makes a bold statement there. Literally, he says, we know you are of the elect, 
We know you are of the chosen ones. Why? Because you responded to it. You know you're of the elect because your hearts have been transformed. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You know that you've been chosen by God because you're alive in God through the Holy Spirit working through the Word. Paul says, I preach the gospel to Jew and Gentile. And if you remember two weeks ago, it was only some of the Jews who were converted. And Paul says, what was the difference? Why was it that you believed and the others were only hardened in their hearts? Paul says it was the Holy Spirit that made the difference. It was the elect that were gathered there. The Holy Spirit entered the hearts of those who were chosen before the foundations of the world. He opened their hearts to believe. And the word transformed them. And Paul says that was who the worker of the word is. And as the catechism tells us, it is the Holy Spirit through the word that works into the heart of the people. It is the Holy Spirit that softens the heart so it will not be rejected when it is preached. And it is the Holy Spirit who continues throughout the life of the believer, opens the word to grow them in the faith. And so the worker of the word is none other than the Holy Spirit. I want to make one comment about the worker of the word as well, but in light of this, notice that this is nothing but grace. If you think about what Paul has just said, that the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the word, that should show you tonight that if you are a believer, that is nothing less than sheer grace. Because God says it's the Holy Spirit who does this. It is His work from beginning to end. You didn't earn this. You didn't achieve this. It's His will in your life. In fact, I, it stands out to me that in chapter, th or, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, we thank God continually that you believed. Isn't that remarkable? Paul says, I continually thank God that you actually believe the very Word of God. Doesn't that show you that it's grace when you believe? Believer this morning, celebrate. If you have living faith, it is because God's grace is in life. The Holy Spirit has entered, transforming your heart, making this word alive in you. It is the worker's grace in you that makes you alive. Here's the point tonight from the Catechism. The power of God's word comes from the Holy Spirit who applies it. The word is always God's word. It is always living and active, whether you believe it or not. But when the Holy Spirit puts it in you and makes it alive, it is His wondrous grace. Now, secondly, then, we need to ask, what is the work of the Word? Okay, it's the Holy Spirit's role to make it effectual, but now we need to ask, how are we to use, or how does this means of grace actually work? Well, the Catechism says, first of all, it works through converting and convincing. And we see that in our text. Let's reread verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1 again. Paul says, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but notice also, with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And there it is. It's almost exactly what the catechism says, that the word was given to the people in Thessalonica, and it converted and convinced them of the message. Uh, that's exactly what Paul did. Paul's calling was to simply preach the word. That's how the means of grace works. Paul was unable to transform any hearts. All Paul did was show up in the synagogue in Thessalonica. He opened the scroll and he preached. That was how the word works. Paul did not bring his own thoughts to bear. Paul did not preach popular psychology. And he didn't give self-help talk, talks. Paul's confidence was that he shared the word and that God would work through that. And the Bible is undeniably clear that this is how the word works. One passage that I'm always reminding myself of in preaching is Romans 10. Romans 10 says, How then will they call on him in whom they, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet are the feet of those who preach the good news. And there it is. That's where the means of grace comes in. How are people to be converted? Preach the word. How are people to be built up in the faith? To be convinced of it? Preach the word. Share the word. Explain the word. That's our role in this. We're to be un undeniably convinced that through the word, God works. Now if you think about that, from a human point of view... That's quite foolish. In fact, actually, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. 
Paul says that the preaching of the word to the world is foolish. Just think about what we're doing right now. You at 7 o'clock on a Sunday night are sitting here listening to a fellow human being, a fellow sinner, opening up a book and preaching. Now, if you just think about it, that's quite foolish, isn't it? There are a lot of better things we could be doing except this. God's in this. This is His chosen means. To the world, this is foolish. You're wasting your time. But you see, if you think about it, that's the point. God has always chosen to use foolish means to grow a church because in that, it shows that it's His power. It is not the preacher's power. It is not the elder's power. It is God's power. And so He's chosen this foolish means of preaching from the Bible to bless His people. So we learn tonight that it is the preaching of the Word that converts and convinces. Actually, in verse 9, chapter 1, Paul says, this power is seen in the fact that they turn from idols to the living God. God's Word comes forth with power, and we are to trust that. The catechism goes on, the other work of the Word, then, is in comforting believers and growing them in the faith. And again, we get a little hint of that in chapter 1. Look at verse 6 there. Paul says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia. And there it is. Paul says, what did the word produce in them? Paul says it transformed them. It comforted them. It enabled the believers in Thessalonica to continue to suffer with endurance. What kept the church in Thessalonica from fading away after Paul was driven away? Paul says it was the Word. It was the Holy Spirit through the message that grounded you. It enabled you to suffer well. It kept you joyful in the midst of all that you suffered. It was the Word that grew them. And so we learn from the whole of Scripture that the Word comforts those in affliction. Time after time, in the testimony of believers, they will say that when the Word was read in the midst of their trial, it kept them grounded. It is the Word that grounds believers in the midst of the waves of suffering. The Word assures us of God's love in the midst of suffering. The Word reminds us that God never leaves us or forsakes us because it's nothing other than the Word of your Father. Just, I would challenge you, think of your own life. What trials have you been through? And how has the Word of God sustained you? Your testimony likely will bear the same. In the midst of those affliction, it was the Word of God that kept you from leaving the faith. Because that's how the Word functions. It grounds us. It is the voice of a father saying, hold on just a little longer. With arms of the Father, He speaks through His Word. And we see here also that the Word then strengthens us in holiness that the Word is used to battle sin and to grow us. Psalm 119, a psalm all about the Word, says this in verse 11. I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that is right. How do you fight sin in your life? You whip out the sword of God's Word. It is that that fights sin. By bearing God's Word in the midst of a trial, the voice of your Father helps you and I restrain sin and battle sin in our life. Here's the point tonight. God's chosen means to keep you grounded and walking with Him is His Word. It is the Word read and the Word preached that keeps His people faithful. And it is God's Word from beginning to end, the voice of the Father that does that. Now, thirdly and finally tonight, then, what are the ways of the Word? So we know this, it is the working of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Word, but now you would ask, how do we do this? How might you and I now use this means of grace? And question and answer 90 gives us an answer. Let's go through that together and notice how they tell us to personally use this. The first way you and I use this means of grace, the Catechism says, is to diligently use it. Diligently and faithfully use the Word. Let me quote you from Proverbs 2 to defend this. Proverbs 2, the father speaking to his son says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. 
And you see, that's exactly it. How are you to make use of the means of grace? The first way is to diligently use it. To, from beginning to end, seek out the treasures found in it, search for it like the, song, or the proverb says, like silver and gold, which is valuable for your own heart and your life. You must be diligently, daily, using the word to grow in the faith. Now, what does that mean by way of application? It means a couple of things, at least. First of all, this means faithfulness in worship. Faithfulness in worship. Hebrews 10 commands the church to not neglect the assembling of the saints. When the church is gathered, the Father is speaking. And therefore, the Bible says you're not to miss that if you're able to be in the worship service. To miss that is to miss the voice of the Father because He has ordained in that preaching, in that assembly, as the primary way you grow in faith. So the Catechism says you are to diligently make use of the preaching of the Word on Sundays and not missing that because that is the Father speaking to you. Now as a pastor, I will say that the sermon might not always be good. The sermon might not always be gripping, but at very least, we will read the Word and you will hear the voice of your Father in that. And God has promised that that will help you. That is through the preaching of the Word, assembling of the saints, diligently used. It also means diligence in reading the Bible, personal devotions throughout the week, listening perhaps audio readings of the Bible in your own life. As one person has said, the more you are in the Word, the more the Word will be in you. I think as well by way of application, it also means praying for a hunger of the Word. Let's just be honest, we all struggle with time management, struggling with attention span, and I think we need to pray that God would give us a hunger for this Word. That we would join David saying, this is like honey. And the honey come to me. I crave to know God's word. Pray that God would give you that hunger more and more. That this would be something that you seek with all of your might. So it is to be diligently used. Second thing the catechism says is the word is a means of grace by way of preparation. By way of preparation. And what this is getting at is preparation prior to the worship service. In other words, the Westminster Divines are saying that on Sunday, you, prior to attending the worship service, can benefit yourself by preparing yourself to hear the Word. A couple, couple ways of application. First of all, that means getting enough sleep before Sunday. Uh, if you are a student, you know you listen to your teacher a lot better than when you have had two hours of sleep. And so it is on a Sunday morning. If you've had enough sleep, you will be better prepared, more physically able to hear the word preached. Uh, just in saying this, I'm reminded that when I was in high school, my parents instilled into me the need to not be out late on Saturdays. Now, I submitted to that, but I didn't fully understand it at the time, but they were definitely wise in parenting me. Because staying out late did not benefit my soul on Sunday morning. And so their goal to shepherd me was saying, be home. Don't be out late because you don't want to be sleepy on Sunday morning. So get sleep before we come to worship is a good way we can prepare ourselves. Second means is coming on time. Being here readily and not feeling rushed, so we're not feeling frantic, arriving on time with an eagerness to hear the word. And I think another application to preparing is perhaps read the passage ahead of time. Maybe email Trudy so that you get the bulletin ahead of time. And maybe as a family before uh, in preparation around the breakfast table. Perhaps read the text that will be preached Sunday morning. That way you and your children will be prepared for the explaining of that passage far better than if you first hear it when it is read in church. Third way that you can make use of this means of grace, the Catechism said, the way of prayer. By way of prayer. Now we already noted this, but I would just add prayer is absolutely essential for the Word to be effectual in your life. Because you are dependent on the Holy Spirit to bless you. A uh, couple ways to do this. First of all, it means praying before you read the Bible. When you do your own devotions, maybe as a family or privately, take a moment to pray that God would bless it. Ask for Him to do what He's promised to do, to open up the Word to you. Uh, also, by means uh, of application, pray before the service. Pray for me, the pastor. Pray for the congregation as a whole. And even pray for yourself. That what God would have to say to you would be applied to you in the Word that day. And I just want to point out that what the Catechism is getting at is that reading and the preaching of the Bible is not intellectual exercise. 
there is a significant difference between preaching and a lecture. A lecture is just conveying information. Preaching is the word of your Father telling you something from His word. And we are to come with that in mind. Uh, next way, uh, the Catechism says, is to lay it up in your hearts. To lay it up in your hearts. And this is getting at the fact that you are to have the word in your hearts and your minds. First of all, by memorizing. The Westminster is saying that it's a profitable exercise to devote time to memorizing God's word. To lay it upon your heart. As uh, Psalm 119 said, that we would not sin against God. Memorize parts of scripture. I think included in this would be the, the profitable uh, effort of meditating on the Word. That throughout the day, if you have a chance to sit and think about something, contemplate on the Word of God. Meditate on it. Ponder over uh, the Word of God. Lay it on your hearts. The final way the Catechism says that you make use of this means of grace is to practice the Word. To practice it. This is what James says in light of this. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. In other words, what the Catechism and James is saying, the word is not simply something you read and go about your business. The word must make a difference in your life. The word is meant to affect your personal daily living as you apply it. And so here's the application from this. You and I must prayerfully put into practice the word. If God is telling you something from the word, we are to, by his grace, put that into practice. If God is forbidding something in his word, by his grace, we are to put that off. His word is meant to be put into practice in our life. Now, in conclusion then, one final thing in our concluding thought, and that is just simply a question that I want to leave you with. And that is this question, so what? Why does this matter tonight? So we've gone through the means of grace of the word, we've gone through the application, but ask yourself this question, why does this matter for you tonight? Why does it matter for me tonight that we know this? And here's the answer that we need to realize tonight. This matters because it teaches us that God in heaven wants to have a relationship with you. You know, we say that so often, and it's so true, that to be a Christian is not really a religion, it's a relationship. But in saying that, we realize what we're saying. This is all about a relationship. This is not about an intellectual exercise where we learn information. It's about loving God more. God says, my word is a means of grace because we're relating to one another. I am your loving Father, and I want to speak to you. And I've chosen through this means to grow you in fostering this relationship. And so tonight, why does this matter in your own life? And it matters because God wants to be relational with you. Now in saying that, that should amaze you tonight. That should cause you to worship tonight because we realize that we are sinners. We have offended this God. We have transgressed His very word that He has given to us. We have offended Him and broken His word. In fact, the Bible tells us we are like rebellious children who have spurned the love of our loving Father. And yet this loving Father in heaven does not say, Be gone with you, I've had enough. He says, I want to bring you back. The word is of a father, just like the prodigal son returning to the father. Do you remember how that parable goes? The father doesn't wait for the son to get to his home and grovel. The father runs to him. Why? Because that's the character of God our Father. He runs to us in His Word with open arms and saying, Come here, my son or my daughter. Let us grow in this relationship that I have formed. And we learn also about the Gospel in this because He works always through His Word. And who is the Word become flesh? None other than Lord Jesus Christ. The means of grace is only possible because Jesus has given His life to make it possible. He is the Word become flesh offered to atone for our sin. And it is the written word that helps us grow in understanding that. All of it centers on God as a Father loving us and drawing near to us. So believer tonight, we've heard about the means of grace. Let us faithfully put this into practice and grow in discerning the voice of our Father. Amen. Let's pray. 
Our God and our Father, we pray that you would do that tonight through the means of the word, the foolishness of what we have just done. Oh, Father, we pray, build us all up in the faith. As we go now into another week of work and serving you, may the words that we heard today, the fellowship that we have shared together, strengthen us for what we will face in the week ahead. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.